Hello everyone. Uh, good evening. My name is Raghunath, uh, and uh, I am an inp independent consultant. I've been working on Android applications mostly for uh, like the majority of my career, and then eventually I pivoted into like focusing on just like general software engineering, regardless of the platform. So uh, over the years, I've been fortunate enough. Uh, to have worked with a lot of different people uh, and have also been exposed to different programming paradigms, frameworks, and languages. As a result, uh, I've been able to build software that is quite stable uh, and has very few production issues and of very high quality, right? And uh, this has happened over a period of uh, years from ideas that I picked up from colleagues, from conference talks, uh, from uh, from general uh, casual conversations with other people, and uh, eventually, like uh, around 2017, I came out with a set of techniques uh, that involves like a little bit of paperwork, uh, certain worksheets, and test-driven development that actually helped helped me uh, help other developers build like really robust software, right? Uh, but then the downside of this approach for me was I had to work with developers in person and then train them in a certain way with a certain architecture or a framework to be able to replicate the same results that I was able to uh, get in my own software development process. Uh, when I presented this topic to the organizers of Meet Code KT, they asked me like, okay, uh, this looks like an interesting thing. Can we do a series of steps? Uh, can we do a series of uh, talks on, on when this, with this topic? And I thought, okay, that would be interesting. And then I felt, okay, like what if I don't do all the things that I do uh, when I coach other people, right? So I started to think about all the little ideas uh, that someone can Im implement on their own and achieve like a slightly more stable application um, on a day-to-day -day basis, right? So this talk is mostly about like those little ideas, the ideas that don't require a lot of training, but then when you look at those patterns, you can sort of look at them and then go back to work and then implement them right away. So th that's the result of this three-part series. So like we did one in the last and some of you would have attended it already. Some of you would have not, uh, but then uh, the, the, the talk is still uh, available on YouTube so you can go and watch it whenever you want to. Right. So we touched upon a set of topics uh, in the last topic, and this one is going to touch upon a, on a different set of topics uh, right now. So uh, with that, uh, let's get into the talk. So uh, when, when talking about building robust software, right, uh, to build robust software, we need to get a lot of things right. It's not like you do this one thing and things will fall in place. Um, you need to get like a lot of things in things right, and over a period of time, you will sort of figure it out eventually, uh, because you're you're doing this on a day-to-day -day basis, right? So building robust software, like the kind of techniques or whatever we discuss, they fall into four major groups, right? So the first one is obviously people. Um, you need people who care, people uh, who want to learn, right? And software engineering itself is fortunately such a profession where uh, most of us are constantly learning, experimenting, and then sharing our knowledge with other people, right? So this is not much of a problem uh, because like most software engineers fall into this category. The second thing is code, and code is also the one that has the highest impact uh, uh, when, you products, when you produce products, right? Because, uh, and developers also produce code on a day-to-day -day basis. So anything that you do, like has some, like the majority of the correlation for stable software falls into uh, code, right? And then there are, there are processes. Uh, when we talk about processes, there are things like that happen before you start writing code, things that happen when you write code and then like you ship, you ship, then there is a QA process and then the app goes to production, right? So processes can be uh, defined as any standardized interaction between uh, uh, teams that you have, right? Like say, for example, how do you get the PRD? How do you discuss the PRD among your team? How do you re review it? Like, how do you split uh, your PRD into smaller requirements and, and so on, right? And then there is tooling. Like tooling can still, again, be like the kind of tools that you're using while development, uh, and while QA, like on, on production deployments, right? And how do you collect intelligence from a production application and so on? So 
So like to build robust software, you need to get like a lot of things correct in all of these places, right? But then we are going to focus on code, right? Because code has less bureaucracy. Uh, anytime like as a developer, you try to bring in a change in a process, uh, it takes time because you need like enough people to agree to it, right? And you also have to be very persuasive, which is very, very hard. But then um, like when it comes to code, you are in responsible for producing this kind of code that you're writing on a day to day basis, right? So there is like way less bureaucracy uh, when it comes to writing code. The second thing is uh, the ideas that we are discussing are very simple, right? You, you don't really need a framework or a library or, a, uh, or anything to go implement it. All you need is like a, a language like Kotlin, uh, which is which has like functional as well as object-oriented programming capabilities. Then you can take these ideas and then apply it on your day-to-day -day work, right? A third thing is uh, like the code is where you start to like hone your craft, right? So if, if you if some of you can re relate to this, right? If, if you're learning to drive a car, um, obviously you have a steering wheel, and then if you're riding a manual car, then like manual shift. Uh, car, then you're going to have an accelerator, a brake and a clutch, right? And then if you remember the very first time you started learning this thing, like most of the time we would have focused on like, um, like sh shifting gears, right? Like turning the car in the right direction. And most of you would have been uh, focusing only on your steering wheel, then your accelerator, brake and clutch, and then your gear shift, right? And then eventually, when once you become more proficient with these things, those become more automatic. And then you start focusing on like driving to your destination safely <clears throat> at a slower pace, right? So eventually, as you keep practicing, you get re you become really good at it. And like you and the car, you become one. And then you start noticing everything that's on the road, right? Like the things that really actually matters to make your journey very safe, right? And once you hone your craft and once you become a very good developer who can write like really decent amount of code, like really good code, then you can look into prob other problems in your team. Like maybe you want, you can help other developers. You can spot mistakes, what other developers are making. You can look into tooling, right? Like say, for example, you don't have a linter, maybe you don't have Git hook set up, then you can probably look into those, right? And then eventually you can look into your deployment pipeline. So basically code is where everything begins. Like once you are really confident about the code, that's when you start uh, seeing inefficiencies in other areas of uh, your code base or your um, development process itself. So that's why we have picked up code because code is like a significant portion of what we do day in and day out. And uh, I also want to give you a little bit of recap about the previous session itself. So in the previous session, uh, for those who have not watched, this is going to give you a quick summary of what we learned. And for those who have already attended the previous session, um, this will jog your memory so that you, you can um, remember what you've learned in the previous session. So the first thing that we learned was uh, about robustness principle and how we can apply ideas from robustness principle into uh, your function signatures itself, right? And then we also looked at, to a, looked at a tweaked version of the robustness principle. Then we saw how you can use Kotlin sealed classes to uh, write algebraic data types. Then we also looked into to total and partial functions and how they affect the predictability when you are calling up certain piece of code. And then we also figured out how you can use types to prevent defensive programming overhead for other developers and yourself. And then we also looked into how we can avoid primitive obsession using uh, types. And here's a link. Uh, we don't really have to go here. I will be sharing the slides later on. So it's all you can take a look at it from here. Um, and one thing that I want to touch upon is basically pendulum swings, right? So uh, pendulum swings is something that we learn at some point in time, and then we start to use it extremely. And then we realize, okay, oh, this doesn't fit in here, right? Say, for example, when you look at how the type system of programming languages evolved, initially we had like a lot of statically typed languages, right? Like think of Java, C, C++, right? And when you had like these strongly typed uh, languages, they provided a lot of safety, but then they were also not very pleasant to work with, right? Because they were inherently very verbose. So you had to type in a lot of code to do things like that are very trivial things, right? And then people and computer scientists started to think uh, of approaching the, the problem of programming languages in a different direction. And that's when they came up with dynamic typing, right? And then they said, hey, you know what? Um, X can be anything. You don't really have to type, like specify the type. 
Um, and uh, this gives us interesting ways to solve uh, general programming problems on a day-to-day -day basis, right? And then uh, people started adopting languages like JavaScript, Ruby, and uh, Python, and 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 those languages have done like really well, right? Like people have sort of like done a lot of things, but then um, the kind of safety that you had with structure, uh, uh, strong type, strongly typed languages, you had to compromise on those safety nets, right? So what could have been a compiler error now becomes a runtime error, right? But then it also helps you to ship incredibly faster uh, when you're building software. And now with Kotlin, uh, there's an interesting mix, right? So on one hand, you have like a lot of safety, uh, but it's too verbose and slow to develop. And then on the other hand, uh, you have dynamic languages that are like really fast to develop like little things, but then when your software becomes more complicated, then it becomes harder for you to ship things consistently with confidence, right? So now what Kotlin has done is quite interesting because now Kotlin uses type inference so that way you get some amount of like a dynamically typed language like field, but like say for example, you don't really have to specify a type because the compiler can figure out the type for you. And in most places you can omit the type and the language itself uh, is quite concise and pretty much close to most uh, dynamically typed programming languages, right? So now uh, if you consider uh, like strongly typed languages, the pendulum swings maybe to the extreme left and then with dynamically typed language, like the pendulum swings to the extreme right. And people have tried both the solutions and then they have figured out, okay, no, now we need, we need to balance. And like Kotlin is one such language where you have that kind of uh, balance, right? And uh, <clears throat> there's one more example of this case. Uh, in the last talk, we were also discussing about how you can avoid primitive obsession. So uh, the fundamental idea is uh, primitive obsession is using primitive types to... Uh, specific like to represent data right uh, so in this first example if you look at password password is represented as a string right so now uh, when password is represented as a string if you want to validate the password you have to create another utility function or another class that would do the validation itself right and this is super procedural like this is how we would do things um, in c right like ignoring the class part so in object-oriented languages, the idea is to put things that are cohesive together, right? Like we need data and the the behavior and the logic that operates on the data are in one place. So uh, here, like the data is in a different place, like it's a string, it can be anywhere. And then the validation logic is somewhere else. So basically this is a super procedural code. Uh, and uh, this causes like a lot of problems in terms of disco in the discoverability, like uh, programming errors and et cetera, right? So what we actually want is something like this, which is actually a type that represents password. So here uh, you have a class that's called password and then uh, it has a member that can validate the password for you, right? So basically uh, addressing primitive obsession requires us to bring the data and the operations that act on the data in one place. Right. So this is a very good idea and it, it works well in most cases. And uh, this person was telling me this lo looks like a good idea and I'm going to use it everywhere. Right. And that's OK. Like it seems a little bit extreme, but that's OK, because only when you take ideas, simple ideas like this and then use them extensively, you will figure out what the sweet spot is. Right. And that's how learning happens for everyone. For instance, in this case, uh, if, if you used primitive obsessions everywhere, uh, if you try to address primitive obsession everywhere, then uh, there are certain disadvantages, right? For instance, uh, what happens to built-in operators? Like you cannot use like operators like plus minus or like other uh, operators that are that is wrapping your own type, right? So in that case, maybe you need an op overloaded operator, but like that really depends on the domain that you're working on, right? And then uh, what happens if you're using it in a very performance sensitive area, like uh, you're rendering graphics on the screen or you're using, um, uh, what do you call it? Uh, using it in the loop or using it in an event stream, then you're going to allocate a lot of different objects, right? In, in that case, your language itself has to support value classes or inline classes, right? So that needs to happen. And then how does your uh, ORM behave? How does your serialization behave, right? 
And you still don't have enough clarity about the problem domain. Do you really want to create an abstraction at this point in time, right? So these are answers that you have to figure on your own. And uh, and it's okay to have a pendulum swing, right? Because eventually you will uh, figure out what, are, what the right balance is, right? So if you find some of these ideas that are like really helpful, just go ahead and try it in your code. It's like, in a, uh, and it, and in, in, in software development, anything can be fixed, right? So that's not a problem. Go ahead and feel free to play around with the ideas that you're looking that you're exposed to in this talk. So now let's get into exceptions. When you talk about exceptions, um, Oracle uh, documentation has this definition, right? They say exception is a shorthand for um, exceptional event. Uh, so which means it occurs rarely, right? So that, that's their point. Uh, I sort of like had to die like disagree here, like sort of like disagree in the terms of if you want to build robust software, you're supposed to treat exceptions as first class citizens, right? Like, because like as beginners, uh, exceptions are like quite scary. Like when I started learning programming and even for like a, quite a few years after I started developing, um, exceptions were some, were one of those things that I was like really scared of, right? And I also did not know how to handle. But then if you take a step back and then if you sort of like try to understand how these things work and how you need to address them, then it becomes much more um, easier to work with. So uh, before we go uh, discuss uh, exceptions and how to handle them, like a few patterns to handle exceptions, the first thing that we want to go ahead and see um, the anti-patterns, right? Like what are all the things that we are not supposed to do uh, when you're dealing with exceptions? So the first uh, mistake that we do is swallowing exceptions. I think like this is something that we do when we are like really, really, one is like we don't really know what we're doing. Like that's when we do this. And then second, uh, when we're like really new to programming, that's when we sort of like do this stuff, right? So uh, here is a piece of uh, sample code, uh, which is making a network call. And then it can throw like a couple of different kinds of exceptions, right? But uh, as you see, the code doesn't do anything. It just like fails silently. So this is one of the dangerous way to handle exceptions because first, if something goes wrong, it's very hard to triage where the problem is, right? Because you have to start from one end and then keep like checking, use use the debugger uh, till the other end to figure out what went wrong where, right? And and in this case, you it's even hard for you to set a breakpoint because there are no lines, uh, like there are no statements inside the catch blocks, right? So you really can't even set, set a breakpoint. You have to write like some println or like any other statement within the catch blocks to be able to understand an exception is happening at some place, right? And it also becomes very hard in well-tested code because you can, uh, if you're doing test driven development and you're trying to uh, write a test, the test would fail silently and you would have no indication of what happened at all, right? So this is one of the most dangerous way to uh, handle exceptions to just like plainly, like flat out ignore them, right? So this is one of the anti-patterns that you may come across in your code base. Uh, the second thing is uh, the catch-all thing, right? So uh, we make a network call, but then we have no clue of what is going on, right? So then what we do is we say, okay, I'm going to call uh, exception, which is like a reasonably good super type. Uh, I like I will I'll come back to that. So it's a reasonably su 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 uh, super type, but then uh, whenever something happens, and I'm going to just show some message telling the user something went wrong. So this is easy for the programmer to do, right? Because your program is not going to crash. Uh, it's going to work no matter what. But then it's incredibly frust frustrating uh, for the end user because they don't really know what's going on, right? Like it doesn't really have to be a client application or a front-end application, even if it is a, a RESTful API and if it always gives the same error, then um, the consumers of your API are going to be quite confused, right? Like treating all these exceptions as one is uh, is a terrible way to frustrate uh, consumers or users of your uh, software program, right? And uh, the other thing is uh, exception is not even the super type, right? Like if your objective is to just like catch everything, you should probably be catching, uh, the catch block should probably be looking for a throwable and not an exception because exception inherits from throw throwable, right? Um, then uh, the third thing, um, usually like I tend, tend not to focus on performance, right? Like performance is something that uh, developers are like excited to talk about. Uh, you say, hey, I'm going to use functional programming, but then we will not mutate, we'll make a copy of an object, then people will immediately bring up 
isn't that like allocating a lot of memory like isn't that like fast enough right so by default everything that you write you should assume it to be performant unless you're working on very specific domains like right? say for example if you're working on canvas if you're looking on um, high performance code execution right like those are areas where you have to be looking at but generally most code that you're um, working on uh, is performant right unless you're using exceptions for control flow right so in this case uh, it's a, is number is a simple function and you give it a string but we are look what we are doing here is we are trying to parse the string and if if the if the parse int function throws an exception uh, we say it's false otherwise we say it's true right and imagine this code being inside a loop uh, we're going to throw exceptions at every single point in time right uh, but then before i say like exceptions are slow i need empirical proof to tell that they're like really slow right so i did a very simple uh, experiment uh, it doesn't ref doesn't reflect uh, any real time code execution which is like sa a sample code snippet but then it's just like to show you how slow disrupting the stack or using exceptions to control flow can be uh, a bottleneck in your program that you uh, especially if you're aiming for performance right uh, so here is a uh, test run from uh, a benchmarking suit that I wrote. So the first one uh, uses return values, right? Like, so it does a test on a certain input and then it says, hey, you know what? Uh, I'm going to say true or false. Um, and then uh, passes the control to some, like executes the rest of the program, right? And then there is this program. Uh, there's this another set of uh, tests uh, that uses exceptions for control flow, right? So we have two different tests. And the way how these benchmarking tests are run is you give a piece of snippet, um, and then that piece of snippet is executed uh, for a certain number of iterations for a fixed amount of time. And then based on the execution, it gives us like the result, right? So that's how it works. So it, there's like a lot of things going on here, but then I'll just call out uh, the most important part. So if you look at it uh, right now on the top, uh, highlighted in red, is the throughput of uh, a conditional check. Right? So you, you're performing a conditional check, and then the check tells you whether something went right or wrong. Right? So the number of operations when that the throughput for that function was over like a million operations per second. Right? And then it was a similar test, now highlighted in blue at the bottom. And when I tried to disrupt the start like by using exceptions for control flow, uh, it fell down to like 31 operations per second. Right? So bear in mind, like this is not like production code, this is like some sample piece of code that I wrote, but then you already see the difference, right? And if you have suspicions about the performance of your code, you should probably run a micro benchmarking test and then um, use these numbers to figure out where the bottleneck is, right? Like not go into the code and directly try to optimize. You'd also use profilers to uh, fix performance problems, right? Like not through opinions or discussions or uh, big O notations, um, right? So th that's how uh, things work. So if I plot a graph, you could see like the exception is not even in the graph, right? Like uh, the, the throughput for each of these iterations, right? So that's how it's slow it is. So if you're using, uh, uh, like don't do it, right? Like don't do exceptions to do control flow. It's just like it's dirty and it's just bad practice. Uh, however, uh, however, if you really know what you're doing and probably if you're doing this on the UI layer where uh, like the events don't happen very often, you, would, you can get away with it. I'm not saying you should do this or you can do this. Uh, that's the only place where nobody would notice, right? And all other places, it's uh, you never know what kind of problems you would end up in. So yeah, so imagine like a flow like this where you would see like uh, have a candidate number, like a list of potential numbers represented at strings and you're trying to do a check to see if it's a number uh, uh, if it is a number or if it's not a number, right? So this piece of code will have like a huge performance hit, right? And when I say uh, don't use exceptions for control flow, right? Like uh, and anything in software development is not absolute, right? And there is an exception for this case because uh, if you look at tests, these are one place. And I think this is the only place where exceptions have been used creatively enough uh, to determine control flow of your test or not, right? So... This is the only place where it is done beautifully. But apart from this, uh, using exceptions in somewhere else to determine the program flow or like 
uh, control flow, I, I don't think it's a, it's a good idea. If you feel otherwise, and if you find uh, interesting use cases, I'll be open to hear. So what happens here in tests, right? So basically what happens is if when you do like a assertion in your test, uh, it throws an exception, right? And the tooling is responsible for figuring out how many tests fail. And it also sort of like help, takes you to the place where, uh, the where the exception was thrown, right? So this is one creative area where uh, people have used exceptions to uh, do control flow. But apart from this, I really can't think of any other good places where we can uh, do this properly. And the other thing is, uh, the other anti-pattern uh, is throwing an exception, right? And if you look at this piece of code, uh, it checks if the balance is less than a requested amount and just like throws an exception and with a like a very uh, unhelpful message, right? So when you, when you talk about exceptions, uh, it's critical that they have a type, like either it really depends on whether you want to create your own type or use one of these existing exceptions, right? Because the standard library itself has like a lot of good types that you can use to indicate the kind of problem that you're running into, right? So make sure that you're using the appropriate type for your exception, right? And um, especially if you're programming in Kotlin, Kotlin has a bunch of preconditions that you can use for throwing exceptions due to programming errors, right? Like say, for example, if you need uh, a value uh, to fall in a certain range, there is a precondition in Kotlin that will let you do that. Uh, if you want to check arguments uh, to be of a certain type or like of, of a certain kind, uh, then there is a precondition in Kotlin that you can use, right? So use uh, appropriate types uh, when possible, either that is built into the standard library or, uh, uh, or create your own types if that is a necessity, right? And also you write useful messages, right? Otherwise it's very hard to deal with uh, problems bubbling up in your programs. So except handling in Kotlin, like how is it any different? So the first thing, uh, especially for people coming in from the Java world is uh, Kotlin does not have this idea of checked exceptions, right? So, it, uh, so checked exceptions where you say, hey, I'm declaring this method, but then this method can throw these three different kinds of exceptions. And if you don't catch those exceptions, or if you don't handle those exceptions, then your compiler is going to complain, right? So when you look at this uh, immediately, like on a first look, it looks like a very good idea, but then there are problems with it, right? Because it clutters the code with a lot of uh, catch blocks, right? Unnecessary catch blocks. And uh, there are like a couple of articles that I've referenced at the end of the talk. You can go look at it and then see what kind of design problems that you can run into when you're using checked exceptions, right? So um, fortunately in Kotlin, we don't have uh, checked exceptions, which means that the language is less verbose and it's more, um, it's more nicer to design with a language like Kotlin. And uh, the other thing that I also have to uh, tell you about no checked exception is the Kotlin Java interop. So in case if you want to dis uh, write a function that throws an exception, but then you want to make it a checked exception in Java, you can still use an annotation to throw checked exceptions from Kotlin. So that way, if you're calling a Kotlin function in your Java code, uh, your compiler will still complain, right? And the second thing that you can uh, uh, notice is uh, the, the try expression, the, the try catch block in Kotlin is basically an expression which means uh, it can return a value, right? So uh, let's say, for example, uh, look at this thing, right? Like say, uh, if try was not an expression, this is how you would do it, right? Like say, for example, it says dog, guard dog result, and then you try to get a dog, and uh, if the dog is not found, then you're probably going to return a failure for the exception itself, right? So if try block was not an exception, one is you have to rely on a, a, a temporary variable because Kotlin also allows you to do uh, val, which is immutable variable references um, without reflection. So now what you would do is you would de declare a new variable and then inside the try blog, you would, you would assign it. And if it fails, then you would assign the same thing, a different value, right? This is what we would do if try was not an expression. But if try is an expression, what you could do is you can just uh, make the uh, variable uh, immutable variable, and then you can, uh, write concise code like this so that you can, uh, you don't really have to mutate the variable in your try and a catch block, right? And you can also use try as an expression. If you have, if you're having a function, you can just like make it as a 
function you can make it you can make the function um return an expression uh, that way it looks uh, much more cleaner right so that's one major improvement in kotlin which m means like uh, it gives a lot of possibility for you to deal with exceptions in a nicer way without using uh, temporary variables or local variables so now we're going to look at a, a couple like three exception handling patterns the first two patterns will show you how um to deal with performance sensitive uh, code and the third one is, is just like one of my favorite ways to handle uh, exceptions in general so the first one is called as a tester doer pattern right like what is a tester doer pattern so basically you have uh, a function uh, uh, i'll talk about the doer first right so doer is a function that can occasionally throw uh, an exception based on a certain state right and a tester is something that can check for that condition ahead of time right uh, if I show you an example, you'll, you'll already be familiar with this pattern. So let's say we do a stack.pop, right? And stack.pop will work most of the time unless your stack is empty, right? So in, in this case, uh, pop is basically a doer. Where it does things or it does things in your code, right? Here, here in this case, it's just like popping off the topmost element of the stack. And if you're going to pop an empty stack, then this is going to throw this exception. It's going to say, hey, you know what? Your stack is empty, right? And if you had a code like this in a performance sensitive area, or if you create a function like this in your own uh, code, then how do we deal with this, right? And that's where uh, the tester doer pattern comes here, right? So here, the tester is the is not empty function and the doer is the pop function. Right? So basically you have one function that does the testing for the condition and then you have a doer that does the actual action like state change or effect or whatever you're, you're looking for. Right? So this is one common pattern. Like People tend to use this, but then uh, once you know the name of the pattern and then once you start seeing this in multiple places, this will be a uh, second nature right like when you when you're trying to implement something so this is one pattern where especially when you have like a control flows like a a, a function that's called most of the time um so instead of relying on like a try catch block use a tester doer pattern like introduce a introduce a new function that will do the testing for you the second one is the uh, try parse pattern right like a try parse pattern is also a very interesting pattern it's very similar to what we did previously but then when you have uh, the try part, the parse pattern fits well when you're dealing with unvalidated uh, data, right? So for example, when you have an unvalidated input data and you're trying to parse this data, right? Uh, in, the, in the previous case, we were also looking at uh, integer.parse int. So parse int will return successfully if you are passing in an integer value. But then if you're going to pass a string that contains a num like a non-numeric character, then it's going to throw an exception, right? So in this case, uh, it's essential for you to name the function appropriately. So what we do is we uh, create a type uh, function called try parse, which verifies if the input is valid and can be parsed, right? So this function's implementation should not rely on exceptions to return a Boolean value, right? So use a regular expression, uh, use bit manipulation, do like look at each and every character, do whatever you want to do, right? But then like don't, don't throw an exception, but then, um, look into the actual data and then figure out if the data can be parsed, right? And then, then you have the parse function, which actually parses. Uh, you should also notice that the parse calling parse function on invalid data will still throw an exception, right? Which is basically the contract. But then again, uh, this is one pattern that we use regularly uh, when you're dealing with unvalid, uninvalidated input data and you're in expecting input in a very, in a certain area. Uh, sorry, in a certain format, right? So here we have a type called serial number and then we're doing a serial number or type parse. And then if the serial number uh, is valid, then we're going to actually parse it, construct the type and then save it into like the database or file, whatever, right? So that's your try parse pattern. And uh, this is the last pattern that I'm going to talk about and which is also one of my favorite uh, pat uh, patterns is taking an exception and figuring out what is going on within it, right? Uh, sometimes exceptions don't need a lot of handling, right? And those are like the most easy kind of exceptions um, that you can get away with really quickly and also don't need a lot of uh, your attention, right? But then uh, you still have non-trivial exception conditions, right? Like there are exceptions that can be quite complex to deal with. Um, 
and uh, each of these state of the exception itself has a meaning in the domain right so and then like an exception can branch out into five or 10 different things and you also have to communicate this to your consumer right when i say consumer uh, it can be your user who is building an android app ios application or it could be a user who is consuming your restful api and uh, the best way to deal with this is again uh, using kotlin seal classes and data seal classes again which means you can use data classes and objects to provide meaning or domain meaning to your exceptions themselves right so let's take this one scenario where you're registering a new user from a client and then uh, some of, one of these things can happen right this is the happy case uh, you're creating a user account right the other thing is you can uh, have other cases like where the email is already registered or the validation errors connection errors uh, the server errors and there are unknown errors right so apart from the first one um, the rest of these conditions would throw you an exception like say for example email uh, and validation errors could be uh, 400 right which is which means like the client has sent error data to the server and most HTTP clients would represent this as a HTTP exception, right? And then you have IO exceptions, which could be a connection error. And then 500 errors is also a, what do you call it? Uh, a HTTP exception, right? So each of these have different meanings and you as a developer are responsible for communicating these different contexts to the user, right? Like say, for example, uh, do they have to provide a different email ID or like, do they have to fix the email ID because they have special characters in the email ID? Um, do they have to turn on their internet, right? Or like, is the server down? So we have to ask them to try after some time, right? So there are different cases and the response from the client is different for each of these conditions, right? So for example, email is already registered. I type in a different email. There's a validation error. Then I have to probably check for uh, illegal characters, right? There's a connection error. Then I should probably go turn on the internet on my uh, device, right? So each of these errors require the user to take different actions. So uh, it's only reasonable for us to uh, represent them using appropriate classes and types. So in that case, what you do is you set up a seal class and then you say, hey, uh, I'm going to map these things into different, uh, what do you call it, different uh, domain um, meanings right like into different types that have domain meanings in themselves and based on these types you're going to show an appropriate error to your consumer and this is how you use it like you look at the response and like based on the seal class then we show different uh, a tailored error customized error message for the user or show a customized uh, response to your uh, uh, consumer right so basically we looked into exceptions and then you're looking at uh, the exception handling summary uh, like um, Kotlin's try expression, test to doer pattern, uh, the try parse pattern, and converting exception to values when uh, dealing with uh, different kinds of exceptions. Right. So now let's uh, talk a little bit about boundaries. Right. So so when we talk about boundaries, boundaries is where like one system ends and the other system begins. Right. Like that's what boundaries is. Uh, uh, the irony is like we all know what boundaries are. Like we deal with databases, we deal with networks, we deal with UI, we deal with a lot of different things. But then when we start writing code, we sort of fail to express the boundaries very clearly, right? Obviously, we use interfaces, but then interfaces are not the only way to express boundaries, right? It's a, it's a good idea. It's a nice idea. But then there are, again, like a lot of traders, trade-offs expressing uh, boundaries through interfaces, right? So how can we express boundaries, right? So let's say we have a problem. Uh, the problem says, uh, find attendees that have RSVP yes or a maybe to one of your events and then remind them about an upcoming event through an email, right? So that's the only objective that we're going to do. And I'm going to show you a piece of code that is very, very trivial. It's uh, very trivial, right? Uh, just to get the point across. And then later on, I'm going to show you a, a fairly non-trivial project that's already available publicly, uh, which you can go and take a look at. So look at this uh, piece of code, right? It says event manager. So event manager is our class here. And then you can see we have a DAO, uh, which lets us access uh, data that is related to the event itself, right? And then you have a mailer uh, that can possibly send emails to your um, attendees, right? And then we have a send reminder function. So the function does something that's very simple. Uh, the first thing that it does is it gets the list of all the attendees, right? It gets the attendees, and then the next thing it's going to do is it's going to say, 
I'm going to filter all the people who have res responded with a yes or a maybe to this event. And then for each of those attendees, I'm going to send a mail, right? That's all there is to this, right? And this is a very simple piece of code, innocent looking piece of code. And probably like most of you wouldn't find any problem with this. It's like, okay, like the concerns are separate. Um, like it's all good. Like I don't see any problem with this. And that's okay if you feel that way, right? Um, let's see the kind of problems uh, that we have here, right? So clearly we have two different boundaries. One is your database. Um, then there is your email, um, event mailer, right? Something that sends an email, right? So at one area, like your uh, boundary to the database ends and like in the other places is where your boundary to the your SMTP server uh, or your email server begins, right? But then like this code does not reflect any of that. Uh, so let's go and see how uh, we can use values as boundaries, right? So the first thing uh, that you will notice here is uh, you have dependencies and then you have a certain piece of logic that's inside, right? And, and that's sort of tricky. Uh, I'm gonna make a very small change here. The first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to pull this piece of logic outside and I'm here I'm using a Kotlin extension function, right? So the Kotlin extension function, um, it works on a list of attendees and it's called attending. And it just does filters uh, people who have responded with a yes or a maybe, right? And, and this is a very tiny change. And, and for most of you, uh, it's not a significant change. Like even for me, it's not a significant change at this point in time, right? Uh, but then we'll discuss what the trade-offs are, right? So now this is the only piece of logic uh, that we have extracted out. Now, if you go to the next screen, uh, now we have rewritten the event manager. And uh, again, like the dependencies are still the same. But if you look at the implementation of this function, uh, you see DAO.get attendees is still the same. Nothing changed, nothing changed here. But then here we use dot attending, right? And this is the place where we have extracted this piece of logic outside. And then we are doing on each uh, mailer dot mail it, right? And uh, most of you would be still skeptical about this, right? Like, and I completely understand. So now let's take a look at this, right? We have this boundary, which is your database, and we have another boundary that is your mm, mail, right? So here we're crossing two boundaries. One is from your database and then into your email server. And then to connect them both, uh, we have a single piece of logic and then some glue code that is connecting these two, right? So basically when you're uh, connecting these two things, uh, two different boundaries, you need one, you need some logic. And the second thing is you need some piece of code that can connect both of these boundaries together, right? So that's, that's, that's all there is happening. So now if you look at what has happened here, right? So now if you look at uh, testing, in the first scenario, how would you test all of these cases? Right? So uh, we have logic where you have to check there are no attendees. You have to check uh, all attendees who have RSVP yes. You have to check for all attendees who have RSVP no. You have also to check uh, uh, all attendees who have RSVP maybe, right? And you also have to mix Yes, no, and maybe, right? So usually when you look at piece of logic, they have several code paths that needs to be tested. Uh, and and the second case is uh, you have to say, uh, I have to write an integrated test because for the dependencies, right? So on the left side, we have all the test cases that we need to write just for the logic. And on the right, we have to make sure that the database and the email, they work together as expected, right? So with this piece of code, the way how the test would look like is we have to mock both the DAO and the mailer, right? And now the DAO has to contain all the five different uh, tests, right? Because like you need to mock the DAO to supply test for all these five different things, right? And then that's when, that's how you can test this piece of code, right? Which means tests become more complicated uh, and for every piece of test, we have to recreate the environment that it needs to uh, run on, right? Like the env environment has to be created for each and every test. So that ex ends up creating large tests, tests with low confidence, and developers also get like really, really frustrated writing tests for systems like that, right? However, uh, consider uh, a scenario like this. So here, all you have to do is you have to write these five different test cases only for the dot attending thing which means you need a list of attendees and then 
uh, you have to assert the value returned by the attendees, right? Because it's also a, a pure function and it's also like a total function. So it's easy to test. So regardless of like the number of conditions or like however the logic evolves, um, the, it's going to be very easy for you to write tests for this, right? And the second test that the only integrated test that we need to write is to figure out if the DAO can give out uh, values, uh, attending gets the right values, and then the mailer emails those values, right? So that's like the only piece of integrated test that we need to write. So just by making sure that the boundary between two different components is a value, we have great testing benefits. Like, uh, and the tests are also a lot more simpler to write, right? And this is a very trivial example. And I had to like sort of like show you where the boundaries are and uh, like where the logic is and how we use the glue code. But this is not the only way to model uh, your boundaries, right? So you could still bring in uh, entire classes and then those classes can be built into uh, your own infrastructure code. Uh, that way things can uh, look different. You can use classes or interfaces to model boundaries as long as you're passing value between these components, right? And once you're passing uh, values between components, the tests become much more easier because you don't really have to rely on who is producing those components. It's just like value in and value out. And those kind of components and those kind of functions are the ones that are easy to test. So this is also, so this is not an idea that I've invented or like anything. Um, this idea is from this thing called as a co uh, imperative core and sorry, a functional core and a uh, imperative shell. So core is where you have most of your business logic. And this logic is where, where you also have like a lot of different code flows, right? So you have like a lot of different code paths that you need to cover and these needs to be tested extensively. And then they also usually don't have any dependencies, right? So there's no mocking. You can test them as a unit, right? Be it a class or a function or whatever. You can test them without any dependencies. And these are the tests. These are the, the functional functionality that are best suited for isolated tests, right? Uh, the other thing is having a shell where you don't really have like a lot of execution paths, but then you have like a lot of dependencies, right? And this is where integrated tests give you a lot of value, right? And uh, more often than not, um, uh, we don't really learn testing from a formal way, right? We, we learn testing from uh, code that we see at work, we codes that we look look up at uh, look up to from online um, code samples and etc right and that's why we tend to mix both dependencies and logic that makes testing more painful and and that's why most developers are also hesitant towards uh, writing tests right because the tests themselves are very bad and hard to maintain and uh, sometimes won't let you change the system uh, that you're working on and this is a non-trivial example uh, that is built using similar way where uh, val like the boundaries or values between different components. Uh, so Fluid is a is a sample project, like a simple tool that I wrote uh, so that I it was inspired by EOMan, uh, where uh, you can specify generators that will generate project uh, project for you, right? It, and and it uses Kotlin's DSL to specify um, uh, templates and uh, directory structures and files, right? So uh, this is a project that has like a lot of different moving components. Um, uh, like say, for example, you need a generator, which is going to be a jar that you would deploy, you would install it on your local machine and then use a CLI to run those tools, right? So there are different boundaries uh, between components that uh, information has to pass through. And uh, all of these boundaries have been modeled through uh, using values, right? So uh, this is a non-trivial project. So uh, this will give you a very good, and also has like a lot of tests built using test driven development. So you can go and see how, uh, in what ways you can use uh, value, in how you can leverage values to design boundaries between components, classes, functions, whatever, right? And also when you have values as boundaries, it's also easy to compose uh, these components nicely and uh, uh, test them um, easily as well. Uh, and what are other places where we can see values as boundaries in white, right? And this is not a novel idea. Like it has been there forever. Let's like say, for example, HTTP is one area where you can see values as boundaries. So if you're a client and, and you're interacting with the server, uh, the only contract between the client and the server is the HTTP request and response, right? Which is basically a value uh, serialized in whatever format that you want, right? It can be HTML, JSON, um, protobuf, whatever it is, right? So when you're uh, designing system, the boundaries are represented by values, then it becomes much more easier for you to uh, 
independently develop these systems, right? Because they're as long as you don't break the contract, these systems can evolve independently. And that's why that's why we are able to develop clients and um, servers independently by different teams uh, spread across different companies, floors, or countries, uh, because we agree on the value as a boundary, right? Like, and, and that's why like these systems are decoupled from one another, and then they can evolve uh, in the, irrespective of one another. And you also see inter-process communication. In IPC would have some sort of data that you pass from one process to another. Serialize, you also have a serialization mechanism, right? Uh, you could see come across remote procedure calls, like similar things. They can go through any kind of uh, like process to process, or they can go from system to system um, or across distributed systems. And they all have like one common uh, value as a boundary that they, they agree upon. Um, then you have actor-based systems uh, where you have like really uh, high throughput concurrency systems. Um, and the only way these systems interact is through inboxes. And, um, and all different actors do is pass messages between different inboxes and then um, each of those actors take their own time and then um, do the things that they're supposed to do. And then most event event systems, right? Like regardless of whether they're message queues or their event streams like Kafka. Um, and, and these systems are also decoupled and high throughput because they are uh, like the value between um, your Kafka stream and your own application is just like a value, right? Like as long as you're posting the right kind of message with the right structure, you will always get the kind of result that you're looking for, right? So this is not, this is a truly well-tested idea um, across multiple uh, systems. Uh, it's truly tested. So uh, why not uh, do it between functions and why not do it between classes? And there are also other architectures that inspire, in, uh, like inspire uh, this kind of, uh, I, the, the acts like what do you call it, leverage values as boundaries, like functional core and parity shell from the functional programming world. Um, then you have a hexagonal architecture, you have ports and adapters, uh, you have Redux, which is very popular. And then um, you also have Mobius, uh, which is a Java implementation of Redux, right? Like you can uh, use it in desktop applications, or you can also use it uh, in non-UI environments. And then you can also use it in Android applications if you want to. And here are some of the references uh, that I used. Uh, I would highly recommend you to go look at uh, the talk from Destroy All Software called Boundaries. Um, it's it's a very good talk. It was, it was presented in one of the software craftsmanship uh, North America uh, conferences. Uh, it's a very good talk. Uh, I watch it like at least once every year and I take away a lot of different ideas. Um, uh, so that's that's one of my, the highly recommended talk uh, from this uh, that that I think most of you would get a lot of ideas looking at the talk. Uh, it's in Ruby, but then it doesn't really matter. All you need to know is to get those the the idea behind uh, or like the way of thinking behind boundaries, right? So that's one talk that I definitely recommend you all to check out. Um, that's it. And uh, if you have any questions, I'm more than happy to answer. Okay, so here is what, uh, I have a question that says, if you make an API call, but you get a network error that the call does not reach the API server, what could be possible issues, right? So there are a few things that can go wrong here, and it all really depends on uh, what kind of client you're using, right? Like say, for example, maybe the obvious problem is uh, uh, your network is down or you're not probably connected to the internet, right? Uh, and maybe your DNS server is not able to uh, resolve the uh, URL, right? And your your server is down, or there could be, it could be a gateway issue, right? And usually, if that that's an issue that the users can resolve, then it's fine. Which is like, if it's a connection issue, users can probably resolve and check for the internet for the check their internet. But then, uh, if something else, then uh, you could just tell them like you ha they have to try after a while, right? Uh, there's not like a lot you can do uh, when your API call doesn't reach the server. 
any more uh, questions? I guess we have three more minutes. All right, uh, no more questions. Sounds great. Uh, it's nice catching up with you all. Hope we can do one of these events in person. Like things have started to improve. Uh, it's nice having you. Okay, so can you explain why we need to go Kotlin instead of Java if you have Java 8 and Python and latest? Okay, so I can't really comment on Python. Um, so Java 8 has some functional programming capabilities. Uh, but then you still would miss on the type system and uh, top level functions. Uh, and Java was initially built as an object-oriented programming language, and the functional features came in once uh, developers started asking for it, right? Uh, but then if you look at um, Kotlin, Kotlin it itself was designed to be a multi-paradigm programming language, right? Say, for example, if you are a functional programmer and uh, you need you really like the functional style of programming, then you can go ahead and pick something like Kotlin and use it, right? And uh, there are also other libraries that augment the functional programming capabilities of Kotlin. Say, for example, if you have uh, immutability and if, you, if, if you're if you into like real functional programming stuff like category, categorical uh, theory, you can go use libraries like Arrow to do uh, functional programming, right? So the language itself is designed with functional programming as a, as a mind, right? Like I am a, I'm a developer and if I decide to do functional programming, like I could do like maybe like a lot of functional programming. Like I can't put a percentage on it. It'd probably be 70 or 80% of functional programming with Kotlin. But then with Java, it would be like slightly lesser. Like the syntax does not yield very easily. There are some features that have, uh, say for example, even in Kotlin, like data classes looks like a very simple thing. But especially if you want to work with event-driven systems and when you're modeling your values as boundaries, you need to look for uh, structural equality, right? So which means uh, data class generates hash code equals to string all of those for you, right? And when your test fails, you have meaningful error messages, even if you don't implement any of these, right? If you're looking for equality, assertions will work as expected. But with Java 8, that's still uh, not possible, right? And I'm, I'm sure like Java, like later versions, I'm not really sure which ones, they have an equivalent. Uh, I, I think they're called value classes in Java, which is an equivalent for data classes. But then um, if you are really looking forward to Val, val, uh, model values as boundaries, uh, Java 8 would fall short unless unless you're using something like Lombok or uh, auto value. All right, all right then. Uh, sounds good. Nice having you here uh, today. Hope to see you in one more session. Um, I think this is going to be just one more session. Uh, on testing, uh, where we'll exclusively focus just writing tests using Kotlin. Thank you, everyone.